Thanks so much, Andrew. Uh, as usual, my only complaint is that you talk too much about me. Uh, you're the real star that makes all of this happen. So again, we couldn't do it without you. So thank you so much for all your behind the scenes work. Really appreciate it. Uh, moving right along. Uh, so Andrew's already introduced me. I, I think he's learned from habit that if he doesn't introduce me, I won't introduce myself. Uh, the main purpose of this slide uh, as Andrew said, uh, we're going to make the slides and things available after the show. Uh, I'm also available to you after the show. You see my uh, email address there on the bottom. Uh, the photo that you see is my Facebook profile picture. So you're welcome to contact me through Facebook Messenger or via email. Uh, I'm relatively anti-social on social media, but uh, in a lot of low middle income countries, social media is uh, the the cellular companies make social media free or low cost. So it's a quite a common conduit for conducting patient care, doing patient consults. Uh, so again, don't hesitate to reach out to me on Facebook Messenger or via email if you have specific questions. This is an evolving situation and we're also discussing a lot in a little bit of time. Uh, as Andrew said, I've done three of these before, and uh, there have always been uh, post-production questions, so you're more than welcome to reach out to me with those. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest. Um, I do do a lot of medical mission work, as Andrew said, so I do frequently receive uh, donations of supplies and equipment, uh, support from manufacturers, distributors, etc. cetera, uh, but I'm beholden to no one in particular, uh, but do feel obliged to say that. Okay, moving right along. Uh, another disclaimer, uh, as you will find on most educational presentations on COVID, is uh, this is a static picture of a dynamic situation. It's rapidly evolving. Uh, so like we'd like to say in a Haitian Creole, degage. You know, we're constantly moving around the situation and adapting to, and overcoming uh, to what we find ourselves in. Uh, to some extent, I mean, that's that's a necessary mindset. Um, we'll talk about some occasions where that's good and when that's not so good and how prior planning could make things uh, perhaps a little smoother. Uh, but the main mindset to keep in mind, again, is uh, we will adapt, we will overcome, and that it is a constantly evolving situation. Uh, right off the bat, uh, I think myself and a lot of folks that work in tropical medicine, uh, yes, this is very bad. Uh, however, uh, a call for calm. We need to uh, step back, take an objective uh, data-driven approach to this and uh, break down a few areas where there's opportunities uh, for improvement. You've all heard about flattening the curve and I'll touch on a few of those things very briefly, but the main thing is, is taking a step back and objectively looking at the situation that we found ourselves in and how can we adapt and overcome and optimize it to keep ourselves and our patients safe uh, and get through this as quickly uh, as possible with optimum outcomes. Some of our Wadham talking points, uh, as I just said, uh, COVID requires a data-driven proportionate response. Uh, I won't read the whole thing to you, but uh, this outbreak, uh, the whole drive of this particular presentation and our organization as a whole is that this outbreak requires an emergency management approach, uh, multidisciplinary uh, and data-driven, data-driven. Uh, we are being buried in a flood of information, quote unquote information. Uh, so I'm gonna try and parse some of that out for you so that we can take a realistic look at our options going forward. One of the big points going forward is that we need to protect vulnerable populations and not overburden the health system. Mm -hmm. uh, our initial numbers coming out of China uh, actually are not that bad. However, comma, uh, there's a lot that's unknown. We don't know the attack rate. Uh, we do know, uh, much like many disease processes, mortality is higher in the elder and uh, particularly folks with chronic comorbidities. Uh, a very uh, 
relatively small percentage of the patients uh, require ICU care. Uh, this is in contrast to some of our other uh, similar viruses like MERS. Uh, so again, uh, just putting those points out there. Key take-home messages and messages that we would like you to disseminate. Uh, I'm assuming that most of the people listening to this are healthcare providers. Um, you know, stay at home. If you're not in a high risk and only have mild symptoms, do not come to the ER. In fact, just don't come to the ER at all, period. Okay, that's a big take home message is uh, one of the ways that this gets spread is because we haven't set up appropriate facilities. If you look at other infectious diseases like cholera or Ebola, right, we have cholera treatment units, we have cholera treatment centers, Ebola treatment units. Okay? Uh, so, what we're trying to do is keep the virus away from our vulnerable populations. Uh, you don't need to be going to the ER that's full of sick people. They're our high-risk group. Okay? Uh, as a professional association, an international professional association, we're advocating for public health departments uh, to establish hotlines, uh, not only for psychosocial well-being, but also for telemedicine. And of course, as I just said, set up assessment centers and treatment centers to protect the vulnerable in emergency departments and other high-risk areas. This also very much applies to an in-house setting uh, where it's preferable to concentrate your resources. Have a COVID treatment unit inside your hospital, inside your facility. If it's not possible uh, to have one outside, don't disperse these patients throughout the facility. Again, graphical summary of the Chinese data, 2.3% uh, of all cases died, 5% critical, 14% severe, 81% mild. And then cases that were not identified and not diagnosed. And herein lies the problem. Okay? It's the bottom of the pyramid, the 81% mild, or cases that were not identified and not diagnosed. Uh, these patients can still be carriers. In fact, they're, they're not patients. That's the problem, is they're not under medical observation. This is why, you know, we're so strident about social isolation. Uh, you know, I'll have a few humor slides. You guys have been buried uh, under it. We've actually started engaging in social media shaming, uh, which in this case actually isn't a bad thing. Um, Again, it's that bottom of the pyramid that is making this so horrible. The, the cases that are easily identified uh, are relatively easy to isolate, quarantine, take the appropriate uh, droplet precautions with. It's the asymptomatic shedders, uh, just like any viral disease. It's, it's always the asymptomatic shedders that are uh, the most concerning vectors and usually the root mean cause of uh, continued propagation. So again, concentrate resources where possible. Uh, for example, based on population density like we're doing in New York or dedicated centers and units like we said. Concentrating resources will have two uh, beneficial effects. Not only will it slow the spread of the virus, but it will also uh, make for proper allocation of resources where we are not squandering uh, PPE. Uh, we have dedicated ventilators, dedicated diagnostic equipment, etc. Uh, so concentrate resources wherever possible uh, is a key concept, again, for multiple reasons in terms of not spreading this to vulnerable populations, but also in terms of optimizing allocation of our precious resources. And that's what I mean when I say mass casualty mindset. Uh, I'm sure most of the people listening are familiar with the definition of mass casualty, essentially when you have uh, more patients than a system can deal with. So everything we talk about in this lecture uh, is either going to be to protect yourself or to optimize allocation of those resources. Okay? 
So mass casualty mindset, lessons learned, previous, uh, previous outbreaks, contributing factors, some of the things that, are, again, some of the things that are proving problematic for us, uh, failure to triage, failure to compartmentalize, for example, separate facilities, hot, uh, separate units. Uh, one example of this, if you were just talking about a hazmat situation, we say hot, warm, and cold, right? Where we isolate folks relative to their degree of contamination. We do the same thing with infectious diseases in terms of, for example, suspect cases versus confirmed cases or folks that don't need hospitalization, again, staying away from the hospital. So key points. Just a brief rundown, I hear these terms bandied about a lot different. So just, just kind of clarifying all of these different uh, flus uh, that you may have heard discussed in uh, light of COVID-19. So H1N1, the swine flu or the quote unquote Spanish flu of 1918, uh, H5N1, bird flu, that was supposed to be our next big pandemic. Uh, but of course, uh, COVID-19 beat it to the punch. Uh, MERS, uh, camel flu, right? and again, uh, these are with reference to the reservoir. Uh, the original SARS in 2002, 2003, and then of course that brings us to SARS, uh, COVID-2, COVID-19, and of course uh, the CoV means coronavirus as opposed to orthomyxovirus. Uh, like the first two flus. Again, uh, we don't call this the Chinese flu, it's COVID-19. The whole point is to avoid stigmatization. We're one world, one fight. Uh, can't emphasize enough, uh, good hygiene, good hygiene, good hygiene. Um, you know, all kinds of jokes floating around now uh, because uh, many, many stores are running out of cleaning products, which makes you kind of wonder what kind of situation we were uh, experiencing with hygiene before we had an outbreak. Uh, perhaps that'll be one benefit, uh, indirect benefit of this pandemic is that it will encourage uh, a much better mindset towards personal hygiene and particularly with respect to uh, seasonal outbreaks. Persistence of coronavirus on surfaces. Not only do we need to uh, observe uh, good personal hygiene, but also with respect to everything we touch. Uh, this is a study that just came out recently. Like uh, a lot of the studies, I would issue the caveat that it is evolving information. When we say persistent, that doesn't necessarily mean infectious, but again, good guidelines uh, for knowing how long the virus can last and encouraging proper uh, antiseptic technique. A good point for healthcare providers, things that you need to do for entering your home. Uh, those of us who work with things like C. diff, uh, we do things like this all the time. Uh, so come home, don't touch anything, shoes. Uh, I'm very fortunate. Uh, I have a mudroom uh, and a back carport, so uh, my neighbors can't see me getting naked before I walk in the house. Uh, but these are all things that are strongly recommended. Um, you know, leave as much as you can outside of your house, clean it, uh, you know, have separate uh, overgarments, things that you use regularly. Uh, like I don't even wear a watch anymore. Uh, I, I kind of got out of the habit working uh, neonatal ICU, uh, but then I got back in the habit. And now it's like, no, I just, I don't wear a watch. It's one more thing to pick up contamination. Uh, so just some general guidelines on cleaning everything. You don't need me to read the entire infographic to you. The main thing is it's meant uh, just to just to make you think. Again, stay at home, flatten the curve. Um, again, we have an unknown attack rate. Why are we concerned with flattening the curve? To reduce infrastructure strain and ensure proper allocation of resources. Uh, so again, the first, the gra these are just humorous graphics, uh, but things that you can use to get the point across. Uh, the first graphic, of course, is uh, not accurate because we have no idea of the TAC rate, but it does get the point across that our asymptomatic people 
are the problem here. They're carriers, asymptomatic carriers. So basically take home message, stay home. No hoarding. Hoarding is not necessary. Okay? Uh, I don't know what the fascination is with toilet paper, but there you go. Uh, the one point that I do want to make about hoarding, uh, if you're not familiar with American slang, uh, we, especially in the military, we talk about the six P's. Prior planning prevents pretty poor performance. So there is no need to hoard, but we do need to look at the situation with open eyes especially with respect to our medically fragile patients. Uh, Wadham recommends that you have at least a month's supply of medications. Um, think about supply chain disruptions, things like that. If you have consumables uh, you know, that are medically necessary, like for example, if you use a BiPAP machine or a home ventilator, uh, things like this. So think about your medical supplies, think about your medications. So triage, how do we keep from commingling folks? Well, symptomatic recognition, of course, is important. Um, so here I just give you a rundown of the common symptoms. And I've used a mix of uh, United Kingdom and uh, United States resources, uh, as well as some Chinese here. So uh, for my American uh, colleagues, if you see spellings you don't recognize, again, it's the Queen's English. So our common symptoms, uh, uncommon symptoms, severe disease. Again, I can't emphasize enough that uh, it's the asymptomatic folks that we're worried about. And that's why we point out these uncommon symptoms. Like, for example, it's associated with a dry cough, but a wet cough is an uncommon symptom. Um, uh, other things that I would point out as we move on to the treatment section is that. Uh, Two of the big problems that these patients have that uh, significantly contribute to morbidity and ultimately mortality, of course, is acute respiratory distress syndrome and renal failure. And I would encourage you to choose and dose your therapies and drugs accordingly, proactively, not reactively. For example, when we talk about airway management and mechanical ventilation, the time to go to lung protective ventilation strategy on a suspected COVID patient isn't when they're fulminant and their lungs are already damaged. You know, you don't want to be going down on your tidal volumes after they're damaged. You want to be proactive, not reactive. Look at the projected clinical course. Uh, adjust your vent settings accordingly, proactively. The same thing, knowing that the kidneys are going to take a hit. Uh, constantly monitor your renal function, your urine output. Very important to remember that we don't have good markers for uh, acute kidney injury. So, the, you know, we're often there's there's a lag time that the kidneys are taking hit that uh, we can be unaware of. So you really got to have your antenna up and be watching for those things. Uh, because that's what kills COVID patients once they're bad enough to get admitted and get admitted to the ICU, lungs and kidneys. So I can't emphasize enough, proactive, proactive, proactive. Think about those lung ventilation strategies early on and uh, watch those kidneys like a hawk. Uh, here, just giving you one example um, from some of our U UK colleagues, uh, don't forget the bubbles. Uh, those of you that know me uh, know I started out in uh, adult uh, battlefield trauma and uh, kind of found myself in pediatrics. Uh, Don't Forget the Bubbles is a really good pediatric resource, but in this case, their practical triage guidelines are applicable across the board, even though they reference pediatrics. So uh, I would encourage you to look at them. They basically reiterate what we've said thus far. Uh, but try and break it up with respect to population density as well as resource density. Uh, you know, in other words, a community hospital versus a uh, level one trauma center. Uh, moving from peds to adults, adult clinical uh, evaluation guide. This is from uh, University of uh, Central Florida. Um, so again, symptomatic recognition. 
Here we go through the labs, uh, procalcitonin. Uh, clues to COVID, of course, are going to be uh, leukopenia. Uh, and again, remember, that's severe. That's severe. Uh, fever seen in 75% of the hospital cases, but almost 50% are afebrile on admission. This is why the testing is such a sticking point and so crucial. And we'll touch on that briefly later. Uh, but it's really important to have a high index of clinical suspicion because we don't have rapid point of care testing. And again, this is how this turned into a pandemic, okay, is failure to recognize and separate patients based on an index of clinical suspicion. That's one of the reasons why one of our big guidelines now is that if you have mild symptoms, stay home, stay home. Okay. Uh, something else to keep in mind is co-infection is common, so uh, don't lose sight of the concept of distracting mechanisms of injury or distracting mechanisms of pathology. Just because your patient pops positive for a bacterial uh, pneumonia or infection, uh, septicemia, something like this, doesn't mean that they don't have COVID. So uh, really asking everyone to keep their feelers up. Now, moving on to imagery, I'm going to, uh, this algorithm talks about chest x-ray. Uh, again, that's because this is a teaching hospital that came up with these guidelines. Uh, one of the evolving trends, and I'm going to give you quite a few slides on it, is using point of care ultrasound and screening patients. And there's many uh, advantages to point of care ultrasound. Now, it's not a slam dunk uh, because the findings aren't necessarily specific to COVID. But again, when we're looking at COVID, it's clinical index of suspicion based on a constellation of symptoms. So using point of care ultrasound in place of x-ray uh, can help us in many ways. The x-ray itself isn't specific either. Um, a patient could have ARDS through some other mechanism rather than COVID. Um, so most common findings on x-ray, patchy consolidations, peripheral distribution. I'll show you some uh, unilateral uh, findings on x-ray or CT, 14 to 25% early on. Then we progress to that uh, ground glass ARDS appearance. Uh, again, we'll talk about POCUS here in a few moments, point of care ultrasound POCUS. Uh, I can't emphasize enough telemedicine, telemedicine, telemedicine. Uh, in these, uh, you know, again, keep patients away from the emergency room, keep patients away from the hospital. Uh, important not only for reducing infection, but also helping us allocate resources at a time when we're already stretched thin. Uh, here, I just give you one example of uh, a common, um, I really shouldn't say pathology, sometimes I joke pregnancy is a parasitemia. Uh, you've got a parasite, but uh, just a, a common health condition uh, that can be handled via telemedicine. And these guidelines, of course, are from American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. So think telemedicine when possible. The role of point of care ultrasound, again, trying to give you a few big clinical pearls here, especially things that uh, have not been emphasized early on or, or have even been spoken out against. And uh, um, the situation's evolving so dynamically that uh, things that were forbidden just a week or two ago, now people are beginning to incorporate them into practice. Uh, POCUS doesn't fall into that category. It's always been useful. I'm just trying to increase your awareness of it. Uh, those of you that know me know it is something that I uh, talk about quite often. Uh, so again, what, what does point of care ultrasound bring to the table? Containment. Uh, we can do it uh, away from the facility or in an isolated unit. Uh, cost. The machines are much lower cost. Um, I'm going to feature one machine that costs uh, under $3,000. Uh, it's multidisciplinary, it's not clinician specific, 
Uh, so you do free up your hospital staff uh, in that it doesn't require uh, an x-ray technician uh, or radiologist to interpret. Uh, and again, increases our index of suspicion, helping us uh, contain and quarantine. There's many devices out there. Uh, Clarius is a common handheld one uh, that's small and uh, readily useful. Phillips, I mean, there's, there's, there's many, many out there. Again, if you've ever listened to any of my lectures, I do entire lectures on all of the available point of care ultrasound devices. Uh, in this lecture, I'm going to talk about the Butterfly IQ, uh, just because I have to pick one and run with it. Uh, disclaimer, obviously, uh, while I do personally own two butterflies and, uh, you know, also use them uh, abroad and encourage clinicians abroad to buy them, you know, but I have no financial uh, arrangements with Butterfly. Uh, why did I choose them? Uh, because of the cost. They are the lowest cost device out there uh, because of the software that they use uh, you basically get multiple probes in one uh, it comes with presets so there's a very low learning curve so if you're trying to screen people very quickly and you want you know plus or minus on your index of clinical suspicion you know relative to lung findings uh, all you have to do is find the window between the ribs it, it's not hard at all I mean, I could probably take all 101 people listening to this, including Andrew and Sarah, who are non-medical, and train you all. I mean, all 100 of you, I could probably train uh, to accurately find, you know, to, to find good lung versus bad lung in the space of two days. Um, Butterfly is ramping their entire production, support everything they're throwing it behind COVID. So not only has it got a uh, easy learning curve, but you've got lots of dedicated support. Uh, like the Clarius, uh, it's wireless, um, well, relatively wireless. Uh, it just connects to your mobile via uh, a cable. The Clarius is actually truly wireless. Why are those important? Well, it's small and wireless. That makes it very easy for infection control. You can easily shield both the probe and the mobile device that you're displaying your findings on. Um, and then, of course, clean up afterwards. Uh, here, just showing you a picture of that, uh, how you know a phone and a, a butterfly device can easily uh, go inside one probe cover. Uh, I'm not going to go through the long ultrasound triage for you here, just showing you the algorithm. And again, uh, butterfly is very appropriately like anyone any ultrasound manufacturer should be uh, very appropriately cautioning you know this is not a slam dunk it just contributes to your index of clinical suspicion which in COVID is what we're running on there's no one cardinal sign or symptom uh, so early literature suggests that patients with confirmed COVID, uh, typical lung imaging features, pulmonary ground glass or consolidation lesions, peripherally located bilateral favor the lower lungs, uh, B lines is what you're going to see. We call them B lines. I'll show you a picture in a moment. Uh, discontinuous rough appearance to the pleural line with subpleural consolidation. And then, of course, uh, foci in the posterior and lower lung fields. And again, this isn't specific. Uh, these findings are from, uh, they're relative to all point of care ultrasound, just like the x-ray findings that I gave you. I took the blurb off of their uh, COVID-specific website, but you will find these findings with any ultrasound device. So uh, again, showing you the A-lines in normal lung, and then the B lines looking through the ribs there uh, with the skip lesion is the last one. Uh, they just had a webinar on this. That webinar is uh, available. Uh, I would strongly encourage you to listen to it. Uh, I know other manufacturers and uh, suppliers also have webinars out there. Uh, so again, I don't mean to advocate for necessarily any one particular device over another. This just happens to be the one that, that I'm most familiar with and that I currently use the most. Uh, this is also the one that uh, we are using uh, in Georgetown Public Hospital in Guyana for rapid screening as well. Okay. 
um, and it is they are compiling a library they're asking uh, everyone whether you use their device or not they're maintaining an ultrasound library uh, of abnormal lung findings in COVID uh, as well as associated comorbidities etc um, so again would strongly encourage you to investigate those resources uh, moving from triage to transport again uh, I'm very big on transport from having, you know, worked with infectious diseases in a, a wide variety of environments and countries. Uh, one key to stopping spread is, you know, cohorting uh, patients. So just a few quick pointers on transport. Of course, we can we can go to a wide variety of extremes, but the key, of course, is good PPE, good disinfection. Uh, I mean, that's where it starts. Where does it end? Well, during Ebola, we would literally put bubbles inside of ambulances and uh, aircraft, and all the patient care would literally take place in a bubble that could then be taken out. So you, you have a whole extreme, but it begins with good PPE and good, uh, of course, good disinfection post-patient transport. I'm uh, just giving you one resource here, uh, CAMES.org. They have a plethora of posts and guidelines and things on their website. Uh, I apologize for not putting the European one up, but again, I, I switch fluidly between uh, America and, and Europe uh, in terms of the resources that I choose here. Um, speaking of which, there's a UK one, uh, Air Med and Rescue. A uh, really good article just came out, patient air transport uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so would strongly encourage you to view those two resources. I know not everyone that's listening uh, participates in critical care transport, so I deliberately did not go into it that much. Uh, feel free to hit me up offline if you do have specific questions about your local policies, procedures, and protocols. Uh, I'll be delighted to, to help you with that treatment so big things that we're looking at in terms of treatment of course droplet precautions uh, transmission keeping ourselves safe keeping our other patients safe uh, so we'll go through a variety of things here um, as um, as was mentioned earlier uh, the psychosocial dimension we did a podcast on that earlier today uh, I cannot emphasize enough that if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of the patients. Uh, there's numerous resources out there. Uh, Wadham, because we are a worldwide organization, we use the World Health Organization as kind of our go-to default. Uh, uh, the CDC also has wonderful resources, as does the ECDC. This particular one, uh, just a nice graphic, uh, things that you should think about comes from University of Colorado Department of Psychiatry. Pace yourself, good health habits, get your sleep, get your workouts, eat regular meals, teamwork, 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 uh, whether it's at home or uh, in the healthcare environment, okay? Stay connected, can't emphasize that enough, okay? Uh, speaking of keeping yourself safe, uh, something I'm not going to beat you about the head and shoulders uh, with is PPE, but I cannot emphasize it enough. Uh, the World Health Organization, the CDC, both have extensive training on their websites uh, from cholera, Ebola, COVID, right? I've dealt with all three. Um, so here just showing you the general way of putting it on. And of course, it comes off in the reverse order. What this slide doesn't show you, uh, of course, is that it's always best to have a spotter. Uh, people make mistakes. We're under stress when we're taking care of COVID patients. You know, it's a stressful situation at home and at work. Uh, so the more sets of eyes we have, the better off we are. So, uh, you know, if I could add one note to this that I left off was use a spotter use the spotter and train like you fight okay before i went to west africa to work in the hot zones i went through multiple classes and that's 
even though I had already had extensive training, uh, both with infectious disease and uh, incredibly toxic substances in terms of donning and doffing PPE, I still put myself through multiple rounds of refresher training, uh, three rounds of refresher training before I went into the hot zone for the first time and, uh, and then started, of course, working in the hot zone and teaching, uh, donning, doffing, uh, et cetera. Okay. Uh, and again, if you have any question about if this is too vague for you and you're having trouble locating specific resources or videos, uh, don't hesitate to ask me. I'll be happy to point you in the right direction. Uh, I cannot emphasize enough, we're in healthcare, Part of being in healthcare is that we have a natural tendency to put others before ourselves. Um, there is no emergency in contagion. Never, never, never. Proper PPE, proper decon, every patient, every time. Okay? There is no emergency. There is no excuse for not using proper precautions for yourself and your environment. Okay? A dead healthcare provider isn't helping anyone. A healthcare provider who's exposed is taken out of the game you've just let the team down so you know don't don't play johnny rescue if you get exposed you just took yourself out of the fight you've let the entire team down and you have compromised patient care for other patients okay uh, cannot emphasize it enough there is no emergency uh, worth not taking the proper steps with ppe and proper decontamination uh, a big concern with COVID, of course, is, well, there's only a small percentage of patients uh, that require ICU care, but more and more people are being called on to deliver that care. Uh, Society for Critical Care Medicine has created a, a wonderful resource. Uh, it's basically a combination of two of their classes, uh, Fundamentals of Critical Care Support and Fundamentals of Disaster Management. Uh, so here I just give you a screenshot, and I'll give you a screenshot of the disaster management later. Uh, but this goes through ventilator management. It goes through, co you know, common comorbidities in ICU patients, uh, things like this. It's entirely free. Uh, this is actually uh, what I'm using to get a lot of people up to speed uh, around the world, both in the U.S. and abroad. This is specifically what we're using in Guyana. Uh, because, of course, with the travel restrictions, I can't go in person. I can only do, uh, you know, teletraining and distance learning. Uh, so I can't emphasize enough for non-ICU folks that don't routinely work ICU. Uh, I'm only, you know, th this is just a quick screenshot. It's not showing you the plethora of free coursework that's available here. Uh, it's really quite complete. Very good at getting people up to speed on operating ventilators, uh, taking appropriate infectious disease precautions, things like that. And again, uh, I'm sure you've all heard the saying, especially if you've hung around with me, uh, education's the most powerful weapon to change the world. Uh, so how can we, you know, this is putting a strain on our resources, so how can we make a bunch of resources quickly? Well, what's the weakest link? It isn't that we don't have enough ventilators, it's that we don't have enough people to run ventilators and we don't have enough ventilators. Um, so how can we produce more trained clinicians rapidly using resources like Society of Critical Care Medicine and uh, Fundamentals of Critical Care Support, which again, they've largely made available for free here, along with Fundamentals of Disaster Management, which I'll show you a screenshot from that later. Airway ventilation, I'm focusing most of the clinical stuff, most of the slides I give you on airway and ventilation because of course, quite rightly, a uh, significant cause for uh, concern for transmission when we talk about managing airway. I can't emphasize enough, this is another big argument for doing it in designated areas. If you do things in designated areas with appropriate PPE, uh, you know, it, it greatly minimizes the need for additional equipment uh, and goes a long ways towards breaking the transmission chain. Uh, I won't go over this with you uh, step by step. I'm just pointing out uh, the Safe Airway Society uh, as another 
uh, international resource for you. And again, you can see at the top, uh, right off the bat, they emphasize buddy check for correct PPE fitting, making sure that there's no gaps uh, in your coverage with your goggles, your mask, your you know whatever you're using for eye protection. Uh, and then also, again, it says PPE fitting. I cannot emphasize enough, use a buddy check for decon as well, okay? Use a buddy check for doffing as well as donning, okay? Uh, another thing I can't emphasize enough going along with uh, my initial call for calm, Wadham's call for calm, uh, there are a plethora of off-label, non-tested, non-validated MacGyver solutions. Uh, I'm not going to discuss them. Uh, bottom line, dedicated wards, proper PPE protocols and procedures. I, I understand that we have supply chain issues. Uh, those are being worked on. In the meantime, some of the things that I've mentioned will help streamline things and conserve our PPE. And I give you some resources later uh, for strategies for coordinating patient flow to conserve PPE. Uh, cannot emphasize enough, what's the easiest way to avoid having a ventilator shortage? Early aggressive use of non-invasive ventilation. Okay? Uh, just two weeks ago, this was completely forbidden because people were like, oh my God, it's gonna aerosolize. No, no, not with the proper precautions. You don't, you can minimize the risk from aerosolization. Uh, if you use non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, it's going to help us conserve resources down the road. Uh, it's going to reduce morbidity and mortality because those patients aren't going, uh, you know, you're going to slow their progression or prevent it altogether uh, into full-blown ARDS. Uh, you can prevent uh, secondary hits associated with ventilator use, such as pneumonia or ventilator-induced lung injury, because again, once we start getting into ARDS, we're talking about very fragile lungs, and it's the associated comorbidities that kill our COVID patients, uh, of course, with ARDS being one of the leading ones, uh, you know, in close competition with the renal hits that I mentioned earlier. Uh, again, with proper precautions, aerosolization constitutes a minimal risk, uh, proper use of filters in your circuits, uh, PPE, appropriately isolating those patients, decontaminating surfaces in the treatment area. Okay. Um, when we talk about non-invasive ventilation, don't forget high flow nasal cannula. Um, here I just show you one brand, uh, Vapotherm. Uh, World Health Organization states in their clinical management guidelines, uh, newer high flow uh, nasal and non-invasive systems with good interface do not create widespread dispersion of exhaled air and therefore should be associated with low risk of airborne transmission. Okay, That's direct from the World Health Organization. And again, I can't emphasize enough uh, you know, that using these early uh, will not only conserve resources, but also uh, promote better outcomes with your patients. Okay? Uh, an additional recommendation, of course, for um, uh, droplet precautions, Respiratory Care Committee of Chinese Thoracic Society uh, recommends placing a face mask uh, if you're doing high flow therapies, uh, such as high flow nasal cannula, which is displayed on this slide. And again, why am I referencing Respiratory Care Committee of Chinese Thoracic uh, Society? Because right now they have the greatest de degree of expertise of uh, any particular population in the world. So the whole world's looking to China and uh, they're starting to get it under control. So some things to think about. Again, here just showing you Safe Airway Society, just another graphic from them on basic setup. Uh, if you have a negative pressure room, that's great, that's optimum. But again, you know, COVID is not Ebola. Okay? Uh, here, just showing you what we set up where. Uh, as much as possible, we try and keep things out of the room to reduce uh, contamination. Showing you what should be on your intubation tray. And of course, can't emphasize enough uh, appropriate filters 
uh, in place uh, in your circuits, where do they go, uh, etc. Again, just another uh, quick resource there for you, just showing you that there's uh, quite a few out there. Uh, I tried to only display things that were valid or show best practices. If you, if you can't read this particular graphic, I'll be happy to pass it on to you uh, via email or Facebook. Uh, just hit me up. But I've also given you uh, the same thing from multiple perspectives. So the, the information's the same, even though the graphic changes. Uh, another one for you again, uh, this is from a Canadian team and just showing you checklist. Uh, cannot emphasize checklist enough. Uh, hopefully you're used to doing checklist before you do invasive procedures. Uh, you definitely need to be doing checklist before you do invasive procedures that also involve risk of contamination. Again, cannot emphasize debrief enough. Okay? Cannot emphasize debrief enough. If I had to pick uh, one, one shot, one kill, uh, I recently posted this on my uh, business Facebook page. I say business, it's a business and a charity, uh, Critical Care Professionals International. Uh, ACRAC, which is an anesthesia professional society, uh, has a wonderful, wonderful COVID airway management. Uh, it really is one shot, one kill, soup to nuts, uh, everything you need to know. It's available for free download wonderful graphics, etc. cetera. Uh, also, I do regularly post things on that Facebook page. Uh, so you're welcome to find that as well, or just hit me up personally. Uh, here, just a screenshot uh, showing you. Uh, so initial triage, escalating support, end of tracheal intubation, and ventilator management. So basically everything you need to know in 40 minutes based on the World Health Organization guidelines, which, as I said, that's as a, a professional association. We are the World Association for Disaster and Emergency Medicine, so we default to the World Health Organization guidelines. And then, in addition to being able to download the presentation, you can also download the checklist. Okay? Uh, I've looked at them. Again, I shadowed anesthesia for two years uh, to gain airway expertise as well as shadowing pulmonologist and respiratory therapist. Uh, so I, I can personally vouch for this. Uh, it is rock solid if you're looking for, you know, one shot, one kill to get your feelers up across the board on all of the aspects of airway management from initial assessment through non-invasive ventilation all the way up to ventilator management and lung protective ventilation strategies this is a great resource for you again entirely free and clinically validated uh, if you're not familiar with lung protective strategies just making sure that i give you a variety of perspective uh, you'll hear different words thrown around if you come to any of my mechanical ventilation lectures you always hear me talk about being proactive not reactive don't wait until the lungs are broke before you start treating them like they're broke uh, so think about uh, early lung protective ventilation, uh, words that you may hear used, low tidal volume, you can do that on any ventilator in any mode, uh, recruitment, of course, we want to open those alveoli. Um, a, a lot of our ICU ventilators have a mode called APRV, airway pressure release ventilation, or you may hear people talk about open lung strategies. Uh, if you're using ventilators, uh, that don't do APRV or you're looking for, uh, again, that non-ICU clinician who's looking for uh, easy guidelines to follow, uh, ARDSnet uh, is a go-to resource, clinically validated, probably going on two decades now. It's definitely a go-to resource, again, uh, not just in the U.S. like the diagram shows there, but these guidelines for FiO2 and PEEP uh, are used worldwide uh, in patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, I promised you I'd throw in something from Las Vegas. Uh, having studied uh, engineering, uh, nuclear engineering, heat transfer, fluid flow, of course, I find ventilators fascinating. Uh, I think it's part of the reason why I'm drawn to respiratory therapists so much. Um, so, this is written uh, multiple simulated patients to meet a disaster surge. 
This was done uh, in conjunction with the shootings in Las Vegas. Uh, so I've, I've given you a screenshot of the paper here. Okay, uh, if you don't have enough ventilators, can you put multiple patients on the same ventilator? Absolutely. Normally, uh, you know, obviously this creates an infection control issue. So we do want to cohort our patients. In this case, you don't only want to cohort them by disease processes, but also by their ventilation uh, characteristics, such as their lung compliance, et cetera. Um, I can't do it justice uh, in the few moments that I have left. However, one of the uh, paper's authors, uh, Charlene uh, Babcock Irvin, um, and my apologies, uh, Doc Babcock or Doc Irving, I misspelled your name here. Uh, so Charlene, oh no, I got it right there. My apologies. I, I was, oh, nope, added a G. All right, anyway, uh, Dr. Babcock does a uh, superb job and believe me, I'm very critical. I don't throw word, the word superb around lightly, especially when it comes to engineering issues and mechanical ventilation issues. Uh, uh, quite often when someone tells me that they're gonna lecture on mechanical ventilation, it, it, they, automatically my shields go up, um, but this is very well done. So again, I hope it doesn't come to that, but uh, if we do need to put uh, you know, one patient or multiple patients on a single ventilator, this is a validated strategy. It's actually been done in the military as well as uh, in Las Vegas. Uh, so here's a very good instructional video. And of course, like a lot of the instructional videos out there now on YouTube, uh, you have a direct link to the CDC there as well. ECMO. ECMO is another thing like non-invasive positive pressure support that just two weeks ago, people were like, oh no, we don't put people on ECMO, they die. Um, you know, we, we can't allocate our resources for that because the outcomes are going to be bad. Uh, I would say that it's a question of perspective. Um, I learned to do ECMO uh, working with neonates with congenital diaphragmatic hernia, but ironically, at the same time, I was also working in a surgical trauma ICU in a level one trauma center teaching hospital with an incredibly high degree of acuity. And it, it was uh, very interesting because at that time, the adult dogma based on the CSER trial was, oh yeah, we, you know, at best we have, you know, equivocal outcomes on ECMO, whereas, you know, it unquestionably made a difference for our neonates. And the CSER trial could be taken multiple ways, but uh, for those of us who are pro ECMO, sorry to display my bias, um, you know, part of the issue, part of the reason you see high mortality in ECMO is if you hold it back as a Hail Mary, you're, you're setting the patient up for failure. The, the time to do ECMO is early when you have a high index of clinical suspicion with regards to the patient's projected clinical course. It's not a, well, we've tried everything, we may as well put them on ECMO. Uh, so also, uh, extracorporeallifesupport.org uh, is your go-to resource, uh, and there's also the European uh, ELSO Society, which I believe you can link to from here. Uh, if anyone can't find the European Society, again, feel free to hit me up. I didn't mean to, to leave them out. Uh, they, they also have excellent resources. I believe these link to each other, the, the ELSO in America and uh, European ELSO. I believe if you go to one, you find the other automatically. I'm, I'm just so used to switching back and forth between the two of them. But uh, again, a dedicated uh, session. Uh, I can't emphasize enough. Uh, consider it early. And this also plays into those transport decisions. Your sickest of the sick should not be dying in community hospitals, right? They need to be going somewhere where we can escalate early and then maybe we can start reducing that segment of mortality. Okay. You know, I don't believe in feudal care, but I do believe in aggressive care. So uh, I think that uh, you know my personal bias is that we don't consider ECMO early enough. And literally in the space of a month, uh, the world's attitudes towards using ECMO and COVID have rapidly evolved uh, and escalated, and it's being used more and more. So please consider uh, incorporating that in your uh, Armory. Uh, quick hits, things people uh, ask about uh, as we start to come to a close. Uh, things that I, I get asked about repeatedly 
uh, two strains. Mm, yes and no. Yes, they differ, uh, but we're still busy working out the genetics in terms of phylogenetics. Uh, they're not different enough that we call them two, two separate strains. Uh, reinfection, highly unlikely that someone got reinfected. They, they may have, uh, you know, we're still working out the natural, natural history of the virus, uh, but basic principle of immunology, uh, you know, if we sensitize the immune system, it does confer a degree of immunity. Uh, in fact, um, there's even some research going on right now, just like there always is with novel virus uh, pathogens, about using survivor serum, you know, to, to transfer immunity to ICU patients. Uh, testing, testing's evolving very rapidly. Of course, the testing splits into two basic types for you molecular biology geeks, guilty as charged. We can do Im immunology-based testing, and we can, of course, do PCR, polymerase chain reaction, uh, genetic amplification. Uh, right now, uh, that's the one that has uh, the greatest degree of FDA approval. I should say the only degree of FDA approval, but I believe there's some immunoglobulin uh, immunology-based uh, test in the pipeline uh, for approval. And of course, those are very rapid. A, a lot of your RDTs, your rapid diagnostic tests, uh, are based on uh, immunology and chromatography. Uh, ibuprofen, totally fine, um, again. Part of the reason I mention a lot of the things I mention is because we're being buried under all of this information, disinformation, misinformation. Uh, ibuprofen is a classic example. Uh, a, a, a physician speculated that ibuprofen might uh, increase morbidity and mortality, and the next thing you know, it's on the internet that the World Health Organization is recommending that we don't give ibuprofen to COVID patients, which absolutely wasn't true. Okay, ibuprofen's fine. Uh, hydro, hyd hydroxychloroquine uh, or other uh, quinine derivatives are. Uh, there's multiple tests underway. Uh, one one small study's been done. Uh, definitely demonstrates a degree of efficacy. Uh, they're not recommending it uh, so much for pre-exposure prophylaxis, but definitely post-exposure. Um, you know, to help reduce viral load. Uh, there's many other uh, trials going on out there right now with retrovirals. Uh, in this case, I do take a step away from the World Health Organization and point you towards uh, the American Center for Disease Control. Uh, they have a really excellent summary that is updated daily on which clinical trials uh, are in place, uh, not just in the U.S., but also around the world. And I'll point you towards some other resources uh, as we start to close up here, too, that, uh, that you can flag uh, for evolving uh, pharmacologic uh, treatments. References, resources. Uh, I gave you the FCCS resource earlier, uh, Fundamentals of Critical Care Support. If you scroll down on that page, this is what you're going to find. So, and why is this important? This comes from Fundamentals of Disaster Management. It's totally free. It's totally validated. This class has been taught for a really long time. Uh, big things here that are important, the three right in the middle. Augmenting critical care capacity, uh, disaster triage, and sustained mechanical ventilation outside the ICU because you're going to see all of those things. We've seen all of those things with COVID. I mean, just if you don't think COVID's a disaster, just cross the word disaster out and write mass casualty, right? Modify staffing and space when number of patients overwhelms capacity. Mass casualty mindset. That's the footing that we're on. Uh, disaster triage. Um, and this also incorporates not just ethics, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, principles of isolating uh, relative to degree, you know, suspect, probable, confirmed, etc. cetera. Uh, sustained mechanical ventilation, we've already talked about, uh, and then some good uh, PPE uh, things here as well. Again, entirely free. Um, speaking of PPE, uh, we have a saying in the military, the more you bleed in training, the less you bleed on the battlefield. Uh, there's numerous resources out there uh, for simulations. Uh, I'm pointing you towards the World Health Organization. Uh, of course, uh, the, the Brits have a, a very lovely one, too, with uh, the NHS. 
Um, I just chose this one because again, Wadham, we use World Health Organization. If you were to scroll down on this page, you would find a complete, uh, complete checkoff list. And again, cannot emphasize enough, train like you fight. The more you bleed in training, the less you'll bleed on the battlefield. Why don't you make a mistake? You know, when you go in the Ebola treatment unit, because you did it a hundred times before you went in the Ebola treatment unit, or even into the triage area. Okay, so uh, train like you fight, train like you fight, train like you fight. Everything you need here, it's fire and forget. If you just scroll down on this page, you'll find everything you need uh, to conduct training for donning, doffing, and uh, disinfection, uh, both in person and online. Again, can't emphasize enough, huge amount of uh, information out there, a lot of it misinformation. Uh, so kind of taking a humorous look. Uh, social media can be very good for some things, very bad for others. Uh, so I encourage you to choose your, choose your media sources carefully uh, and choose what you trust. That's why I've only, I only use a few, not, not because I wanna be in an echo chamber, uh, but because I use trusted and validated sources as does Wadham and as I recommend here. Uh, some of the ones that I recommend specifically, uh, of course, Wadham.org, the World Health Organization, CDC, uh, Butterfly that I mentioned earlier, uh, British Medical Journal, New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, they've all made all of their COVID materials available for free. Um, information is beautiful, uh, validated graphics uh, as far as the COVID outbreak, uh, if you're interested in formal coursework, uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine is offering a free class that uh, just started on uh, COVID-19 through Future Learn. So again, screenshot for you there, uh, totally free. Uh, I mentioned I would give you a resource uh, through National Institute of Health, uh, Lit COVID, keyword here, curated literature hub, tracking up-to-date scientific information, okay? Uh, most comprehensive resource on the subject, central access, okay? Uh, they're updated daily and categorized by different topics, geographical location, etc. So again, lit COVID. If you just search for that, you'll find it right away. Professional societies, uh, please do not forget to look at society-specific guidelines. Again, we're asking our clinicians to work outside of practice areas that they're not used to, okay? As I said, generalists may be providing specialty care. I give you two examples here that are near and dear to my heart, uh, American Burn Association. Um, you know, I, I work with a burn hospital in Nepal. Andrew mentioned I had an ongoing project in Nepal. Uh, I, I work with a burn and cleft uh, charity there. Uh, the American Burn Association is putting on a free webinar uh, March 25th on burn patients and COVID. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, Bitty Babies doing it for the babies, right? So, uh, again, more guidelines from ACOG on evaluation of pregnant patients with suspected COVID. Uh, again, no omission of our uh, uh, international colleagues was intended. I just happen to have these readily at hand and have personally used them and validated them. Uh, cannot emphasize enough, uh, when we take care of the patient, we take care of the whole patient. So I've given you lots of tips and tricks, things to be aggressive about in terms of hands-on skills, but don't forget your verbal communication skills. Uh, you know, most of us have not worked outbreaks before, and knowing how to communicate with patients and family members in the face of an outbreak it, it's, it's not something they teach you in medical school or nursing school. So I've provided a resource here, uh, Vital Talk, uh, COVID Ready Communication Skills. Uh, and again, I spent quite a bit of time on it and uh, it's quite good. So if you're wondering how to talk to your patients, your family members, your friends uh, about the pandemic, uh, this is a very good resource for you. Uh, don't forget, laughter's the best medicine. I'm from the South, so we kill germs the Cajun way. Uh, Tabasco hot sauce hand sanitizer. Not only will it kill germs, but you'll definitely not put your hands on your face if you clean them with this. Uh, in closing, uh, again, uh, stay safe, stay sane. Uh, as I always say, I've always been crazy, but it's kept me from going insane. 
Uh, thank you very much for listening and thank you for all of our frontline providers out there. Again, please don't hesitate to reach back to me uh, via Facebook or via email uh, if you do have specific questions. I know we covered a lot of material in a little bit of time. I tried to point you to the best guidelines that I have and the ones that I personally use. Uh, but again, I, I won't hesitate to, to answer your questions if you reach out to me. Uh, we'll, we'll give you a few moments now to do that. Uh, but I'm sure like, you know, I'm like most of you, uh, I can't spend too much time because uh, we've got to get, get out there and do our jobs. But we'll open the floor to questions for a few moments. Uh, Andrew, if you'd be so kind as to take over and direct folks accordingly. Sure. Thank you, Sean, for that. A lot of, a lot of good stuff there. A lot of good resources. Uh, thanks for taking the time to put all that together in the presentation today. Uh, we're a bit over time, but uh, I think we can have a few questions here. Um, I did receive a question from Rakesh Gupta. Um, he initially sent it by text and I asked him if he would ask you directly. It's uh, related to POCUS. I'm gonna unmute you, Rakesh, if uh, you're still listening. Uh, are you there, Rakesh? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, yep absolutely. Yep, go ahead. Great, uh, thanks a lot for to both of you guys for putting this together. This has been a really great learning experience. Uh, I'm an emergency medicine resident, and my question is around using POCUS uh, and contamination of the uh, ultrasound machine. Um, so we're pretty used to wheeling around a machine in our department and using it for all sorts of different purposes. And we're seeing more patients that are query COVID who have been swabbed but are awaiting swab results uh, with varying levels of actual kind of pretest risk. Um, and I was speaking to a local intensivist recently who uh, was saying that there was a risk of contaminating uh, ultrasound machines and that there, it's not really easy to, there's not really a good way to clean these machines. And so he was suggesting avoiding using uh, the the non, um, like, like the smaller ones that you're, uh, that you were talking about are nice because they can be completely contained within the um, uh, PP for larger machines. Do you think it's a risk of transmission uh, in bringing them into patients' rooms? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and that was one of the points I was trying to make with uh, talking about the the smaller point of care uh, machines. Uh, and again, if uh, if you can, if you guys have uh, discretionary funds. Uh, there's several mo several makes and models out there for you know under 10,000, under 5,000. I just happen to mention the one that I have the most recent experience with that my team's currently uh, using. But uh, yeah, uh, using using one of the larger devices, uh, they can be uh, you know we, we we can drape them out, but it's not optimal. It really isn't optimum. And I'm not, you know, I'm used to working in resource limited environments. So I very rarely, you know, recommend, oh, yeah, sure, you got a few thousand dollars laying around. Buy, you know, who has a few thousand dollars laying around, you know? Uh, yeah, that's not something that I typically recommend, but your uh, intensivist is absolutely correct. Uh, if you are quote unquote stuck with using that larger machine, uh, and, and of course, they're wonderful. You know, they bring their own assets. You know, they they uh, bring their own assets to the table. They're more capable than the point of care units. Uh, but with the caveat uh, that it really does need to be draped out properly and properly deconned afterwards, if possible. Uh, if you if you're if you're stuck with a larger machine and you have multiple larger machines, it would be ideal if you had one just for your COVID patients. Right. Okay. Yeah, thanks so much for the question, uh, Doc Gupta. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Sean. Um, we have a few more questions here. I have uh, a Keel. If I mispronounce your name, I'm apologizing in advance. Uh, I see your hand is up. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Uh, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. You have the floor. You want to go ahead and ask a question, Sean? Okay. So uh, thank you both of you for the wonderful talk. Um, I'm hearing uh, everywhere now on social media, we're seeing uh, doctors here and there speaking of the shortage in PPE. So I'd like to ask if you have any practical solutions uh, regarding these shortages. For example, if I should, if it's okay to wear the same mask for the whole uh, for the whole shift, for example, as I'm an ER physician, 
So uh, if I'm going to be wearing the same mask for the whole shift, is that okay? And any other uh, practical solutions and thanks? Sure, sure. So there's a variety of approaches to that. Um, you know, we're always worried about cross-contamination. Um, and, I, you know, I should have put something on that in these slides. Uh, you just pointed out a really egregious oversight. Uh, there's, there's multiple ways to, um, you know, disinfect things. And hospitals are looking more and more at things like incorporating uh, ultraviolet light because we, we are looking at reusing things. Um, if you email me, I'll be happy to send you papers on uh, different methods of uh, sterilization. Uh, but, and again, I don't work in your practice environment, so I don't know, you know, which patient you're going to and from, um, but uh, low risk, uh, patient population, especially if you guys are uh, being aggressive about segmenting your possible COVID patients, uh, you, you should be relatively fine with what you're doing. Uh, and then in the meantime, of course, uh, not only are we looking at ways of sterilizing that equipment, but also increasing production and uh, making our supply chain a little more robust. But in terms of personal protection in the moment, uh, it, what you're doing is probably okay. I would need to actually be where you're at to make certain, but in general, it's okay. Does that make sense? Did oh, I lose sorry. you? I had already, uh, we had already muted his microphone there. Um, back, I'm not seeing him on the call now. I think he may have dropped off. Oh, here we go. Uh, you still there? I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. I, I, yeah, yeah. I was I, muted, so I didn't know what to do. Yeah, no, it does make you. sense, actually. It's okay. So, actually, we do segregate. We have a segregated um, uh, a room just for suspected cases and then another area for uh, every other person. So, uh, so people who are going to work in this place are just going to be working in this place, and uh, people dealing with COVID are just going to be dealing with COVID. So uh, yeah. actually, I don't if, I don't want to take too long, but is there any resource for how we can actually sterilize these equipment? Uh, for example, if I have a plastic uh, face shield, will it be okay to just, yeah. you know, rub it with uh, alcohol or give it to our technicians yeah. and they can deal with it? Yes, ab absolutely. Um, there, there's definitely ways to deal with it. And uh, as I mentioned, if you email me uh, or hit me up on Facebook, I'll be happy to pass you along some papers. Uh, sure, sure. Because again, remember, I'm used to working in low resource environments. So we, we have all kinds of ways and uh, the FDA is actually fast tracking some stuff and issuing uh, guidelines literally even as we speak. Um, so it's nothing I can tell you quickly other than what you're doing is good. Uh, and then if you email me, I'll be delighted to send you some additional information at the Great. institute. Thank you okay, thank you, Dr. Akil, appreciate you. Thanks. Who else? We, we, did have, uh, we had a question from Dustin about how to access this on YouTube. Um, and we'll be sending out an email uh, within a few hours. We'll do a little edit to the uh, clip and then we'll have to upload it um, to uh, Wadham's YouTube channel. And once we get that done, uh, we'll s share that link as well as the link to the slides and uh, uh, Sean's email address as well. And uh, hopefully that will be done within a few hours of this. Uh, we have a question from Lynn about asymptomatic patients. Um, I'm going to go ahead and unmute Lynn. Uh, you there, Lynn? Yes, I am. Hi, thank you. For, this was an excellent talk. Um, my question is uh, with the idea if you are in a region where you have multiple hospitals and designated some that will deal with the non-COVID issue, um, how do you make sure that you don't uh, end up admitting a patient who lo and behold was, had, uh, was either asymptomatic carrier or had such atypical symptoms that you miss it, particularly when we don't have rapid turnaround time uh, COVID testing and don't know exactly the the accuracy or sensitivity. Yeah, so yeah, there there's there's the rub. And um, so basically, you know, like you like you said, the, the first key is uh, having des you know having designated areas. 
uh, next key having a high uh, clinical index of suspicion and you know when in doubt um, they get treated like they've got COVID you know I mean everyone can get fooled you know it's it's an honest mistake but if there's any doubt in your mind uh, you know that's what we did during Ebola uh, that you know we uh, would separate you know segregate patients and it's like okay yeah this one's you know this one's iffy you know, so we're not going to put them with the confirmed patients, but at the same time, we're not going to, you know, they're sick, but we're not going to quarter them, you know, in the general hospital with general patients either. Um, and, you know, I mean, you do your, you do your best, you know, and if so would you, go ahead. would you recommend then that even in your non COVID designated hospital, that you have another segregated or walled off area for those iffy patients yes, that you're not sure yet. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, yeah, apologies to your hospital administration if I just gave you ammunition in a running gun battle, but I'm on the side of the practitioner. So holler at me, sister, I'll give you more ammo. So yeah, absolutely. If you have Thanks. any, if you have any possible inkling, they need to be segregated. Um, absolutely. And even if, like you said, I mean, they're iffy. It's like that. That's the horrible thing about this disease is that there are so many, um, you know, non. There, there's no hallmark sign or symptom. Um, so yeah, even if they're iffy, put them, you know, se separate them out. Uh, you know, guilty until proven innocent. Uh, so yeah, you're you're taking the right approach. Absolutely. Thanks okay. so much for the, the, yeah, thanks so much. That was a great question, Lynn. So I'm sure a lot of people have that same question. And and yeah, it, it, it makes me mental. I mean, I it, literally multiple times a day, I, I get reports and people asking me about patients, you know, possible patients cohabited and, it, all, all, you know, that they haven't separated out the cohorts. And it's just like, are you kidding me? You know? So yes, very good question. Can't emphasize that point enough. Thank you so much. Who else we got, Andrew? Uh, we have, looks like one more. Um, okay. Let's go ahead and uh, Melody uh, has her hand up. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you, Melody. You'll have the floor. You still with Are us, Miss Melody? Yeah, it looks like, Melody, you have your, oh, there we go. You had your oh, microphone hi. muted. Hi, Sean. Hey, this is Melody. Um, I actually took one of your uh, CMPT classes at Chalk, and I passed. Yay! Oh, yay! Yay! Congratulations! Congratulations! Thank you. Yeah, you guys were awesome at Chalk. I loved you guys. <laughs> it was a amazing class. Thank you for your work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just have a question um, for suspected um, COVID patients after the time of death. Is there a uh, best way to take care of the body to prep the body do we need to bleach them down or anything yes um so obviously the body needs to be handled in full ppe um they need to be put in um non-permeable uh container and of course that also needs to be covered with uh th that also needs to be bleached down um if uh, I know it's going to sound really morbid when I tell you this, uh, but the you, you know we had a, a, a lot of uh, fatalities with Ebola. Uh, there are really excellent videos on the World Health Organization uh, website about how to deal with Ebola fatalities that are directly applicable to this in terms of infection control. So you're, yeah, you're not going to find a lot of videos on okay, how do I do postmortem care on a COVID patient? Uh, but in terms of, you know, how do I do postmortem care on an infectious patient? Uh, yeah, both the, the CDC and the World Health Organization have excellent uh, videos that actually bear out exactly what you're saying. Uh, okay. Just make, yeah, just make sure you bleach the body bag as well. It, and do we allow the family members to see the patient or um, what is the best practice for that? So again, these are evolving guidelines. Historically, uh, we encourage family viewing, but through appropriate barriers. Uh, you know, so it may be one of those. And, and again, that's that's uh, 
you know, I can't emphasize the psychosocial dimension enough. Uh, you know, we we horribly start people in the past by not allowing them proper closure uh, with their loved ones who have died from infectious causes. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you have to, if you don't have a, you know, I seriously doubt you currently have a designated area for viewing because we simply don't have a high enough incidence of fatalities. But it's definitely something you should discuss with your team uh, about, okay, well, hey, we're going to convert room such and such because, you know, it has windows. But under no circumstances are you going to, you know, allow family members to don PPE and enter an infectious environment. environment. But, uh, but under all circumstances, you will do everything you can to allow that, those loved ones to have closure. That, Thank you so much. Yeah, no, that was a, that was a really great question. Thank you for asking it. I appreciate you, Melody. All right, take care. Okay, we got one question by uh, chat. Um, it's from Kelly Carr. She asked if I could just read this for her. So uh, sure. Kelly says that she's a flight RN in a rural area, and she wanted to know your thoughts on putting a high suspicion, pa suspicion patient in an aircraft. Sure, and, uh, a, and a lot of it's situationally dependent. Um, and, uh, and Kelly, I don't, I don't know if you're in the US or Australia or Canada, where, where you are. Um, I, I provided a couple of, I, I hit them running, and I, I didn't really go into them in detail. Uh, but if you go to our CAMES website, uh, they do provide uh, guidelines both for aircraft and ground ambulances and under different circumstances, uh, such as highly probable, uh, you know, is the patient ventilated on a closed circuit, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, you always have to be prepared for worst case scenario. Um, also, the uh, Association of um, Aeromedical uh, Physicians uh, is, or Aeromedical Physicians Association uh, is going to be having a webinar on exactly that topic, uh, and if you and you can link to that from the Kane's website. Uh, I personally don't have a problem with it. Uh, I, you know, transported uh, probable Ebola patients by ambulance. Uh, you know, I, I personally don't have a problem with it. But then I was personally uh, responsible for, uh, you know, preparing the ambulance for transport as well as decontaminating it afterwards. Uh, so under the with the appropriate precautions, I, I have absolutely no reservations at all. And if you need more guidance on the appropriate precautions, again, the CAMES website is kind of a hub that links to a plethora of resources. And if you still can't find what you're looking for, again, please don't hesitate to hit me up via email or Facebook. Uh, I'll be delighted to, to answer your questions further because, uh, as I said in the webinar, you know, your safety comes first. And uh, if you have concerns about your safety, that means you're not giving optimum patient care. So we, we need to make sure we take care of you first. So uh, hopefully the CAMES website will answer your question and point you to where you need to go about what the proper precautions are. Uh, but if it doesn't, don't hesitate to hit me up offline. I'll be delighted to take care of you. Thanks so much. That was a great question, Kelly. And uh, Kelly just wrote back and says, thank you. So. Um, and uh, I, I just want to thank you, Sean. I, I don't see any more questions, and we're actually at the 90-minute mark, so I think it's a pretty good time to wrap up here. Um, yep. uh, thank you, everyone, for participating. Um, and uh, apologies that we, we couldn't have more capacity for this webinar. We did try to increase it unsuccessfully. Uh, as stated, we will be sharing the uh, link to the video and the slides and Sean's uh, email address. Uh, hopefully within about two hours, we'll have that all online and send that out to everyone by email. Um, and don't forget the podcast on psychosocial issues. Uh, can't and understand. I'll also, yeah, and I'll also include the link to the, uh, the podcast we did this morning, uh, which was quite good. It's about a, a 20 minute um, kind of discussion. And I think it could be uh, quite, of use for participants on this webinar as well. Uh, so with that, Sean, uh, I just really want to thank you. Uh, thank you. I know it's nearly half hour over the scheduled time, so um, thanks for donating that extra 30 minutes of your time. I know you're very busy, and I know your phone's been ringing off the hook a lot lately. Um, and no everyone work. just 
be safe, and uh, we'll get this, through this together. Yep. Oh, yeah. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, we'll see you on the we'll see you on the Ethernet. Take care. Bye bye.